Good afternoon. We're delighted to welcome you to the NMC On the Horizon Games and Gamification. The NMC On the Horizon reflects this, reflects this research and work of the NMC Horizon Project in action. In these Google Hangouts on Air, international panels of experts are convened across all education sectors to address the emerging technologies poised to significantly impact teaching and learning. In today's one-hour Hangout, Mario Herger, founder and partner, Enterprise Gamification Consultancy, LLC, will moderate this live panel discussion on games and gamification. I am your host today, Alex Freeman, director of Medea at the NMC. Amy Blake is joining us on technical support. Please feel free to ask a question via the Q&A function if you have any questions or if you encounter any technical problems. Sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the following discussion. But first, a bit of logistics. In this session, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A, and also plus one a question that you are interested in having answered. We will collect your questions throughout the session, and our panelists will be tackling these throughout and at the end of the session. Uh, if you would rather tweet, our hashtag for today's event is, is uh, hashtag NMCHZ. That's hashtag NMCHZ. Now on to the moderator of today's uh, program. Mario Herger had been Senior Innovation Strategist at SAP Labs in Palo Alto, California, and Global Head of Gamification Initiative at SAP, where he had worked for over 15 years. He also co-founded co and leads the Austrian Innovation Center, Silicon Valley. Uh, Herger has encountered and supported gamification efforts from multiple levels and departments, like sustainability, on-demand, mobile, HR, training and education, and banking. He has driven the awareness around gamification and organizing and leading innovation events around this topic, holding dozens of one to two day gamification workshops, working with gamification platforms and service providers and game studios, consulting and advising organizations, and by incorporating gamification into SAP's strategy. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mario. Thank you very much, Alex. Such introductions always sound fancier than they are. Uh, what I do basically is I help to make work and education more fun. That's the short version of it. But we have today a, a, a very nice selection of panelists available from the education and uh, the museum space. And I wanted to start with uh, <clears throat> quickly having each of the panelists introduce them in uh, two or three sentences. And uh, before we come to a little definition of games, play, etc., and uh, start with the questions. I would like to start with uh, Brian, uh, if you could start quickly and introduce yourself. Certainly, Mario. Thank you um, for that introduction, and thank you, Alex, for everything as well. Uh, my name is Brian Yonke, and I am, I guess, one of the few representing higher education here. I'm an instructional designer at Case Western Reserve University where I focus a lot of my efforts on all sorts of academic technology inside, outside of the classroom as well as online and have um, been working on projects for the last several years that are tied to gamification. Thank you very much, Brian. Next one is uh, Elise, Elise Keeler. Hi, I'm Alice Keeler. I was a high school math teacher for 14 years, and now I teach at the university. Uh, I teach pre-service teachers, and I like to incorporate gamification techniques. Uh, but I do consider myself more K-12, so I'll let Brian handle the higher ed. Thank you, Alice. And then we have another Alice, Alice Schwartz. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Alice Schwarz. I'm a museum educator here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and currently oversee teen programs, weekend and holiday events for 11 to 18 year olds. And my colleague, Masha. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm Masha Turchinsky. I'm senior manager of digital learning here at the museum um, in the digital media department. And I focus on Public facing technology, which is um, which is often online or in gallery or mobile, um, and certainly involves games sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Masha and Ellis. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, uh, Ruth, please. Hi, I'm Ruth Niemeyer. I'm at the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, representing both health professions, education, and higher ed. 
Thank you very much. So, so we have a, a very nice setup of interesting uh, panelists today. Before I start with the first question, I wanted to make clear a, a little bit on the definition of some terms and vocabulary that we are throwing in and around. We talk about games, we talk about gamification. So when we talk about these things, we distinguish typically between play, game, series game, simulations, and gamification. Uh, there is a distinction between them. A play is something that, for example, a little child does. It takes a little break and then pretends that this is a game, a car, and drives around with that. There are no rules. There are no goals. A game, on the other hand, uh, has rules and goals. Think of Monopoly. There is a goal to win, to make the most money. There are rules of how to achieve that and what you can do. And people, of course, are cheating here. Yeah? Then we talk about serious games, and serious games are games that are built for different primary purpose than entertainment. They typically aim at teaching a skill. Uh, and then we talk about simulations. Simulations are not necessarily games or gameful. They tend to reproduce uh, a real, real world scenario. And then finally, we have gamification. Now, gamification does not mean we have here a game. We create a gameful experience or enable the player to enter a gameful experience by using game design elements, things that make game fun uh, and apply them to, well, for example, a business software or a learning system or any other website, for example. Now, the first question that I have to each of the panelists, and I would like to start again with Brian, is what is a great example of gameplay gamification that you have seen or experienced or maybe even created in game in, in education? Brian? Well, uh, the two that I want to speak of real, uh, real quickly so we can get everyone to talk about um, are specific projects that I've I've been part of, um, and there are two different sides of gaming gamification. Uh, the first one is really kind of what what got me into it. Um, back when I was at the University of Colorado, um, I had worked with some colleagues of mine on developing an actual card game to help. Um, help us um, essentially support our faculty. Being an instructional designer, working with academic technology, a lot of a lot of the work that that we do was to help faculty not only uh, use technology but but understand it and, and learn how it can be applied in their pedagogies. And so we we developed a, a card game that was actually based on another card game that was successful in the video game realm and so th there was a, a game called the metagame um, that came out and I, I don't have the years off the top of my head but 2009-ish um, um, that was used at a conference for people to kind of just have some fun play some games but ultimately it helped them learn about the different games that were out there if, if, if they had no understanding of it and we took that game mechanic and applied it to faculty development and essentially built a game that was called the CU Online Card Game which I can kind of show you here and it, it, it involved a, a bunch of uh, cards and with questions on the back that had a little bit de of, of debate type questions and so it was kind of the debate mechanic um, and then other cards that had tools on there like this one says Jing and then the idea was that the, the, the players would essentially debate the questions based on different tools that they had on their cards. And there was a whole set of rules on how, on how it worked. But we focused on keeping it easy and really utilizing it as a tool for them to actually have a resource deck of tools, but also have a fun way to kind of learn the tools. And then we took that card game and, 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 and that concept and developed, um, for many of you that were at the NMC, um, conference last year, remember the Horizon Project card game and, and developed that a, a, in the same way where we had a way for people to take common things that were part of the Horizon report and um, kind of debate them and have some fun around it and, and for those that were unfamiliar with the tools were able to um, actually um, learn the tools. Um, and the other thing that I, the other side that I think is a great application and it's more of a gamification is the um, the idea of, of badging or achievements. Um, 
specifically in higher education, but this permeates through all of education and, and some of the other disciplines. And, and we're actively um, exploring badging at, at CASE, but it's, it's essentially more of a, a gamification where you take an element of a game, so this achievement idea, this reward, um, and applying it to different parts of, of the educational system, whether it's um, um, credit, non-credit, um, it could be in your HR system at your university, but you take these these badges that you would achieve and then you can climb in much higher levels. And as we go on, we'll talk more about that. But those are some really great examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. At least, Kira, do you have an example for us? The, the example of how, we're using, how I'm using gamification? Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I use it more with how I do grading. So my uh, pivotal moment is when I had a student uh, come up to me and say it is homework, and I'm like, it doesn't have an impact on your grade because of all of the, the other work that he's done, and he just went from being really excited to being really dejected. And that's when I realized that our system doesn't really work. So when I look at games, how can I help students to level up? And it is surprisingly very motivating. So for my um, doctoral program, well, some of us, we've taken the list of things that we need to do this semester and we put it on a spreadsheet, Google Spreadsheet, so it's shared. And then some of the people, those who want to, uh, because competition is not always motivating for everybody, has put their names along the top and then we X them off and can kind of see who's accomplishing what. And that was, that was helpful, but then I assigned random XP to each of the tasks. And then as we X them off, it now says, you are level 15. And uh, it is surprisingly very motivating to want to do work, even though we're already motivated. So I look for things um, from games like that that I can apply to my classroom. So I have my students in my class at Fresno State leveling up as they complete assignments. It's not necessarily tied to their grade, but just helps them to feel like they're making progress. Um, so, so the students are not not going for the grades, but they're going for the high score and the leveling up. This is you, the game you know, you're making it sound like you know it's it's just a trading one external uh, motivator for another, mm -hmm. um, but really it's about goal setting and progress. So when you and see progress, immediate yeah. progress, uh, when you know that you're making success, then it makes you feel like you want to continue on that that your efforts. Um, have value. And so, no, I don't do grades uh, in my class that I teach, which of course drives the students wild. They, uh, in a, not a good way, it's bonkers because it's so unusual to them, but they're so used to grade grubbing and wanting the points that we lose the forest for the trees that we're there to learn. So I try to engage a low risk of failure. It's, that is really hard for students to take a grasp of because what we tend to do in education is we give kids a quiz which should be formative assessment and just to help us know where we're at um, but then we burn it into the grade book with like a laser and it just sits there and haunts the student throughout the semester screaming you're a failure and it just doesn't help them to feel as motivated as they could be as if we learn from what games teach us is that we should have a low risk of failure you should set goals. Um, you should uh, benefit from those around you to recognize the strengths and weaknesses of team members and choose people who are going to help you to succeed towards a goal. So when I do gamification, I look for things more along those focus on the learning and not focus on whether or not your grade is holding you back. Yeah, you mentioned a, a couple of interesting things, progress, failure. We'll, we'll come to that and talk a little bit later about that. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, Alice, uh, Masha, can I ask you uh, the same question now from more in uh, uh, museum exhibition uh, education space? So um, a game that we created, co-created, I should say, really was uh, covering my goals as a museum educator and teen programs when the American Wing here at the Met went through a major renovation and opened in January of 2012. I wanted to create an event where high school students were introduced to the vast array of the collection at in the American Wing, physically have to find their way around it, and have hopefully such a good time, a social interaction, that they would want to return to the museum. So those were my main goals, and I wrote a what was going to be a traditional scavenger hunt, which was solving a murder. Murder at the Met, an American art mystery where 
a particular well-known image in our American Wing collection, Madam X, by John Singer Sargent, um, was found murdered at the end of a fictitious gala event here at the end of the 19th century at the Met. And the idea is based on the game of Clue that high school students would have to find certain works of art and solve who killed her, in what historic interior was she found murdered, and what work of art was used as the weapon. Right. Well, it became, well, it actually evolved from Scavenger Hunt to become Clue. Yes. Yeah, actually. So that, that's an interesting way that uh, we worked together. The idea was so interesting. It was going to be a one-night event um, with a great deal of effort going into it, many people playing roles. And when Alice described it to me, it sounded like a perfect opportunity to just create a, a game using this murder mystery idea. So in the end, the game that we hit upon was Clue. So it, came, it went from a, treasure, a scavenger hunt idea to the game of Clue, uh, where we were able to, to have um, objects you know, provide alibis uh, or, or become a witness to something, or t and also to provide three different, um, three different paths so that the groups that evening could all play but not find themselves all gathering around one particular object at the same moment but it also allowed for people who wanted to play again to have another opportunity to experience the American Wing on a different day and, and have a different outcome, even though they were playing with the same objects. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're bringing, bringing out really a great uh, example of that. Uh, you have narrative, uh, role play, a mystery in there, and uh, the, the players, your, your visitors basically are having an immersive experience. It's not just that they get the facts, yeah, and then they forget them, uh, and they remember only 10% of them, but with such an immersive experience, you keep mu retain much more of the information uh, in such a thing. Yeah? Uh, it, is, it is also used, I know, similar examples from spaces like compliance training, so something that people have to do and don't want to do, and uh, you put them into such a murder mystery, who who siphoned off the money from the company or something like that? Yeah, so that's that's a very and who who doesn't like Miss um, Miss Ma Marple or Hercule Poirot, some Agatha Christie stories, yeah, with all the success of this. By the way, uh, I think I think you already uh, you see that you're from we see we can see for that you're from the museum. Uh, you're beating us already. When I look at the background, uh, you have already the most expensive kind of furniture here in the back. <laughs> Picture. So you are leading on the leaderboard here. <laughs> Ruth, uh, what 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 example do you have for us? The if you look across the health professions literature, there are a lot of ways that pharmacy, nursing, medicine are reporting that they're using gamification actually for the students. I think one really popular one within pharmacy education is Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy more so because it's easier than trying to come up with a wheel for your classroom. But, you know, they'll use topics like, you know, medicines to treat ulcers or, and then you can go down through and they have a list of questions and the, and the faculty have been very creative at coming up with what those, what those topics can be in there. And, and across the health professions, I think that's a very popular one. I actually developed a baseball board and used it in class one time and, and played baseball on a, on a board in my classroom with the, with the students and that was fun and then I think also the other there are some card games as I was watching him present about the card games I was thinking that maybe Magic the Gathering is probably the ultimate card game since that was originally developed uh, by a teacher to to do math and so it's probably the most popular of all of the gamifications that we have right now and even some of the you know the college students are playing that they're not learning much about pharmacy but at least they're getting their math in so those are the you know the kind of things that we've been doing uh, simulations if you talk about gaming we're starting to get more into that but um, those are more case presentations and I'm not sure that all of the the components that we want to talk about game and gamification are in the simulations that we're using mm -hmm. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, we heard now we heard now a couple of uh, game elements or elements that make games interested. We heard her progress or or competition or uh, role play and mystery. Now, if you uh, what what is uh, you know it's, it's a difficult question because if I ask uh, what is a good uh, driving experience, is it is it you know a red starter cable in the car or is it the leather seat or uh, 
<laughs> it, all the combination of that makes it, of course. But uh, maybe our panelists can tell us a little bit what they think uh, makes a game interesting, or maybe what traditional education uh, makes makes it so sometimes boring or not not interesting or engaging. Uh, let's start this time a little bit different. Uh, let's start with the, the Museum of Modern Art, <laughs> the museum. Uh, Alice and uh, Masha, maybe you have you have an idea. Because I remember when I was a kid and I had to go to the museum, it was always super boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had we did not have these great <laughs> museums that I'm from. <laughs> uh, the new idea. So. Well, let's see. What what Alice? Why don't you start? Now? I I, jump in. I mean I would say again from the museum educator perspective that. Uh, anything that has to do with a great story. I mean, every work of art has a great story, and when you start to thread works of art together as a museum experience, uh, I think people learn better from a great story. It's details that um, they're going to remember later. Uh, I think it requires their own imagination and sort of participa participation within the story. Um, so that would be one thing for, for me, particularly... Um, not only making learning hopefully a little bit more fun, but the retention factor in going through a good story. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I would say that uh, you, you started to say something about the immersive experience. I think there is something, uh, and, it, and it, it, it dovetails with the narrative, that there is something fun about playing a game where you are potentially you are playing a role or you're putting yourself in the foot of someone who, who was an interesting character or had an interesting life experience. But something in their lives is worth documenting by another artist. I think there's uh, that that really can give people who are visiting the museum a really unique perspective on history or time, or place. Um, and I also think one thing that we, I think a lot about with games at, at a museum that's the size and scale of the Metropolitan Museum is um, it's a big place, and sometimes it's interesting to think about games that allow people to have. To, to have an experience in that hour or two hours that they decide to come and participate that is that maybe is a bit finite that that you can come and and achieve something and learn and feel like you've learned something the museum is so big that um, you could stay certainly for days hours years in our yeah. case but but there is something interesting about coming in and feeling like you that you get to you get to play a game and you learn something and you and you have a you know an object differently more intimately than than in another way. And I would only add one more thing that in a museum setting because you're kind of driving the vehicle when you're here in most cases unless you're coming as a school group that just random choice that you choose which gallery you want to go into you choose which work of art resonates for you and what you find more interesting and you choose how much time you want to spend at any particular object or area of a museum yeah. 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 very different than going on a guided tour where someone is holding up a, you know a sign that says okay now on to the next painting in, in fact, in fact, storytelling. I mean, we are hardwired for stories. Yeah, that's how knowledge was uh, transported, basically, to us, and that's why we remember in 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 books, uh, especially the stories. Yeah, even in in this in this nonfiction books. Yeah, uh, and also there's a researcher indicates that, uh, for example, kids yeah can focus much longer on things when they take a role uh, or when they are in, in the story. So they can basically when they tell them to stand still, they can not longer stand still than two minutes, um, but if you tell them they are a guard, uh, you know, guarding something, they can stand still up to 15 minutes, yeah? And that, that is a tremendous uh, amount of time. Ruth, uh, what would you say, what, what would you like to uh, see always used in, in such an experience? You know, I was thinking about this as they were talking about the, the role playing, and I actually think some of the competition of getting the most points or collecting the most um, words or the most money, uh, play money in our case in the Jeopardy is motivating for the students and they want to mm -hmm. be able to show you know the information that they know and so they are more motivated to go learn it so that as they're competing they've got the answers and those things that they need so I think the competition is also an important part. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, competition is 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 is, th is in fact an important part. It's also a tricky one. So you need to always take a look at uh, who's actually competing or participating in that, and there may be gender differences actually. 
but often it, it helps to engage uh, right away from, from the beginning. But, but in the end, of course, you need to create a, a, a more a longer lasting experience with that kind of thing and not make people feel that they all lose. You know? uh, so I, th I think competition is, is a good part. Uh, and as like everything, there are also something that you have to think about. Elise Kila, what's, what's your take on that? I think if you look at a variety of games, Yahtzee, um, Candy Crush, uh, Farmville, <laughs> World of Warcraft, they right. all engage different types of gaming elements. Some of them are solitary games, some of them have competition, some of them have um, a variety of things. Uh, storylines are not storylines. Uh, it's really, it can be very powerful, but it's not required. And so I think my takeaway on that is there's no magic formula. It's, mm -hmm. it's that all of them have some motivating aspects to them, and it's it's the total design together that can be designed well or poorly. Um, so I just wanted to touch on where you talked about competition. And I'm just going to tell you, you would never, ever, ever want to compete against me. I will crush you. I will step up my game. I will stop eating and stop sleeping just to make sure that you are crushed. So that means if you're in a class with me and the teacher says, the first person who, everybody else will stop competing. It can be very demotivating to some students, especially when you know that somebody is going to be able to leapfrog ahead of you. So one of the things we learn from games is to always have a challenge that's within your reach. And so sometimes creating a competition takes that out of the game. So I like to encourage yeah. that you that should be competing against yourself, uh, like she had said, uh, had said about collecting the most points, but not necessarily against others but just a, um, a tangible goal that you can achieve. Yeah, yeah. Combine, combine competition more with, with the progress. So that means that you compete against yourself. How well am I doing in comparison to the last week? Yeah. I mean, one thing is if competition is not set up properly uh, and you feel it's unfair yeah, and you can never reach that, you're not engaging. Yeah? And in the end, only one person can, can win. And in a learning, uh, in, in learning environment, competition may actually impair the learning progress. Yeah? So, so I think while competition is an important element, uh, you may always combine it with other elements so that non people that are not like Alice, yeah, super competitive, uh, also have a motivation to do that. And good games such as World of Warcraft actually cater towards different types and offer you different ways to engage with this system. Brian, uh, your, t your take on this, on this question. Yeah, I mean everything I've been hearing kind of fits 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 the um, boat as far as items that really can make learning engaging through 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 games and gamification. Um, the challenge is the is a very important aspect, and the idea that you can actually apply these techniques to kind of give students or give learners uh, a way to challenge and even the achievement factor. You know, there's always you know. We've all grown up playing games, whether it's video games, board games, or card games, um, but we understand the concepts and we, we, we play them for different types of reasons, but it's usually there's a challenge to it and there's something at the end that you get. And and so the, I think that's important, but one, one some of the things that I've taken from, from these elements and applying them into learning is that the, the gamification in games can really foster creative thinking and and more importantly collaboration and social interaction and that's really where I've taken advantage of gaming is to get people maybe even sometimes out of their comfort zone to work with on one another's whether they're trying to achieve something together whether they're competing against one another um, the, the, the collaboration is going on and these are skills that, that our learners are going to need down the road um, in, in the real world uh, mm -hmm. Honestly, and really what it comes down to, I think, you know, some of the best learning occurs when you don't know what's happening. And if, if you can create um, an element in a, in a learning environment where the students don't even know the learning, they forget the clock is even on the wall, they don't even know that the class has ended, you've done something really well and really engaging. And quite frankly, it's got to be fun. You know, um, like you had stated, Mario, um, that's what you do is you make thing, you make learning fun, and and I think that's an important aspect of all this. Maybe even the most important. You you bring up also a number of points that that I think are very important for games. One is you said collaboration. Yeah, actually, when we talk about competition, 
most games are actually more social than competitive. Even even poker or so, which you would say is very competitive, is actually very social because if they would mm -hmm. be able to read the social cues of the people, and and that's a that's a that's an important aspect. Uh, today, uh, often education spaces, the education space is not really, you know, fostering collaboration. Uh, the tests you take them alone, yeah, basically. Uh, it's actually forbidden to work together on a test. Uh, we call that cheating, yeah. Uh, but but that's not not educating the kids or preparing the kids for the work environment where we actually should collaborate. So so for me, gamification is always very very social, in 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 that uh, in that in that sense, yeah. Um, we we have already a lot of questions that I see here on the, on, on the right side, uh, so maybe maybe I I am asking my other questions later because I think uh, there come some things up. Uh, one that gets a lot of upvotes is: Do gold stars and badges really have anything to do with games, or are they just forms of feedback? Something we already know we should be giving to learners. So, what is your uh, what do you say about star, gold stars, badges, uh, basically extrinsic motivators? Uh, who wants to who wants to take that or, or say something about that? I, I certainly can say a couple things. Okay, Brian. Um, when you look when you look at badging, it it it's nothing new, and certainly we've got new technology that can give us the ability to apply it to um, kind of Smart, modern pedagogies, but there's nothing new about badging. You know, a lot of people use the metaphor of the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. It's the same thing, and, and, and nothing's changed about that. We've just been able to kind of um, uh, give it a, a digital side to things. Um, but but outside of that, I, I think that, you know, one thing that it does, well, let me just backtrack a little bit. Um, there is badging um, going on. It's been going on for quite some time in, in, in video games, at least for the, la the, 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 the last generation systems. Um, anyone out there who has a PlayStation 3 un understands that with the whole trophy system that goes on in there. And these are a series of achievements that people actually work towards to, for whatever reason, quite frankly, I, I ignore them. Maybe it's my age, I'm not sure. But these are something that, that our younger generation really grasps. And, and, and that's something that, you know, we should take note of and, and find ways that we can apply it into teaching and learning to help motivate them. So if anything, it is a motivator, and we talk about that a lot of times. But I see it as more than just something that we're already doing. It's just it's another perception that can bring in bring in our learners and engage them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who wants to talk about that? It, I was just going to say, you know, it's, it's something that's visual and, and just like with storytelling, good graphic design and visuals can really help you. If you've ever looked at a spreadsheet, you know, and, and which basically a grade book or a progress report is and you see a sea of numbers, it's really hard to personalize that. Uh, and feel proud about it. Whereas if you can provide some sort of visual imagery, you instantly know and understand the data in ways that is much more meaningful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, one thing, of course, is uh, with points and badges and gold stars and extrinsic motivators, uh, they give you they give you a sense of progress. That's correct. But Brian already mentioned he is not actually playing on the Xbox for the points and the badges. It's like like you play uh, Angry Birds just for the points. Yeah. Which nobody really does, yeah. And and in fact, uh, you played, or or you would not go in the museum because you get a badge there. Uh, but in this case, it was a murder mystery, so it was you turned it interesting, yeah. It became an intrinsic motivation to learn something and be interested. And actually, there is uh, some evidence on that. And this is a book that I really highly recommend, uh, "Punished by Rewards," by Alfie Cohn. And he talks about this uh, this style of you know dangling the carrots are always in front of them. And he makes the case basically um, de-emphasize badges and points and gold stars. Go and try to make it interesting uh, for the learners, for the people that you try to engage. Yeah. So let me let me see. There are tons of other questions, and then one one is interesting. One that's getting upvoted here a lot is. Uh, uh, I wonder what learning theory, theoretical frame, framework, a framework to support gamification there is, yeah? particularly in digital and or mobile form of gamification. Good question. Good question. 
Anyone wants to take that? Marsha, you're smiling. You're OK. <laughs> Why not? We're going to I mean, I, I don't want to take the uh, claim to answer for everyone, but I, just some things that we think about in in museum education and the museum in general, I think, apply to, to gaming theory. Um, so one of the one of the theories I would I would put out there is constructivism and how we have uh, with, uh, like a Pine for example the idea of coming in every every learner comes to the museum with their own lens and their own past and they have to come in and they and their own perceptions and so even with a game like Murder at the Met you had to make calls on whether someone was suspicious or not based on the clues that we were providing you but I would also say that the the learner's uh, perception of the information that was being provided always provides an interesting critical lens. So I think constructivism, it, it, you know, it, the, the eye of the beholder, it, it still plays a part in in a game and also an amusing learning experience. So that's just one. Okay. Um, I would say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Who who wanted to, to say something? I, I I'd be more than happy to comment on this. <laughs> I, I, I think I think you can take gamification and apply it to any learning theory out there. Um, constructivism is an obvious one. Um, you could even apply it to well. I think even um, experiential learning. I mean, that's that's gaming in a, in a nutshell. Um, it's active learning. This is getting people out of the seats and and getting them to do something. And and a lot of the learning theories out there kind of apply to some of these active techniques or active ideas. And so I would I would say that you could. And and just game design in general is something you can't just say just apply it to a syllabus and say I'm I'm going to have a game in my class and it's going to make my students learn. You just like any any time you're applying anything new to a pedagogy, you have to spend some time with with it. And and just like um, looking and and if you you know you stick to a certain type of learning style or learning theory, you can apply gaming to it. It's just going to take time and you got to figure out what works best for your situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alice I was just going to add, what learning theory does a pencil uh, support? <laughs> Gamification, anything else is a tool, and it's how you design the environment uh, in response to the theory and how you apply it. So I think that's maybe looking at it backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, um, you know, we should not think, uh, stick ourselves too much to any theory here. It's, a, it's of course, an evolving topic that's uh, drawing and pulling uh, <laughs> Oops, car outside. Uh, that's pulling from multiple uh, fields, uh, such as games, behavioral design, motivational design, uh, 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 etc. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is something where we come together the first time with that and see that. Here's, here's another question from the audience, from Margaret. She asks, and, and I think partly we already have answered that. Uh, she says, are games of gamification motivating for all types of learners. What about students who shy away from competition? I, I'll take a stab at it, Mario, since I couldn't get my mic undone for the last one. Uh, and I agree with Brian on those, the active, you know, the active learning. And I, I even think the pencil, you know, requires some active learning. And so I think when you use the games or you use the gamification, it allows a student to almost take on another role as a participant in that game rather than themselves. And so you may see some students who are not necessarily into the competition will still participate because they can become someone else and participate, it, participate in the games from that perspective or it doesn't necessarily put them on the spot alone, like if they had to raise their hand and ask a question if they didn't know something. So I think it allows them a, a different alternative path to do that. And not everybody is going to participate at the same levels. And if you read the, the gaming literature about who plays and how they play, that people, just as they learn in different ways, play the games and learn also differently. OK. Anyone else who wants to respond to, to Marcus' question? I, I think, um, I mean, I struggle with this too because I think really what it comes down to is there's, there's we, we wouldn't be debating these things today and beyond if there was a perfect way to engage all of our learners. And, and quite frankly, I don't think it is. I'm not 100% sure gaming can engage every kind of learner. Um, 
to Alice's point, it's it's just another tool that we have, and if we utilize it, you know, efficiently and optimally, it could be just another tool that we can we can use. Um, because I, I I don't think everyone attracts themselves to games at least as much as we would hope, or any other type of um, teaching methods mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, maybe maybe one one thing about that. Uh, you you talk about learners here. Margaret was talking about learners. Yeah, you know, types of learners. So when we approach uh, gamification design or look at that, one step is always who are the players. So we refer to the learner or to the user as a learner. That also keeps us keeps in mind, keeps brings us to mind all the time that we have to make it fun for them, which we mentioned that because the player he needs to have or she needs to have fun. Yeah. And uh, when we look at the player, we look at at least eight different dimensions. Uh, one is, for example, the gender. Is this a is this a boy, a girl, a man, a woman? Is this from which culture is this person? Is this a nation from Asia a person? Is this from America? Is this from Europe a person? Uh, what's the age of that learner of that person? Yeah, uh, that has an influence of what uh, things they like uh, or prefer. Uh, or which games they grew up with, for example. Or we look at what we call the, the player types, such as the killers, the explorers, the achievers, and the socializers. Yeah? And all these, these dimensions then have an influence of uh, what elements may cater towards these types of combination of players or the others. So typically we try to create uh, a design that involves more, and that is important in such a broad space like education or museums. Let's let's look at uh, an, another another question, and I I'm not just selecting the ones that have the highest numbers here, yeah, so that makes it easy for me. Uh, I have a lot of questions here, a lot of interesting questions, but I I take the one that are upvoted the most. To Michael's point, I'd like to hear the panels this thoughts on educational forks of popular video games like Minecraft EDU or Carbal EDU. Is this approach generally limited to K to 12, or is there potential for broad application? That's a question by Lou Rinaldi. Should I? Should I? Re you can see it. Yeah. Should I? Should I repeat it? So, so what about these educational forks of popular video games that we have? Does it make sense? I have seen fantasy football being currently used, like in history or geopolitics and things like, or in sales that people do that. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? I'll jump in. Um, you know, it's going to depend on how the teacher designs the learning environment. That's going to be my answer pretty much all of the time. I could give Minecraft to a teacher and they could bore the snot out of the kids even with that. Uh, you know, how are you going to engage them and what theories are you using and what, what is the pedagogy supporting what you're trying to do, having a goal, having some directions for the kids to do and not just randomly throwing a game at them. Um, it, it really, I, don't, I don't think that Minecraft or any of those is necessarily any better than doing anything else. I think the most important thing is it's something that the teacher themselves is really excited about and they're trying to incorporate student interests and if they're excited enough about it to go learn about it on their own because they're probably not going to receive a really good professional development in service on it, um, that that enthusiasm is going to be a big motivator for kids. Yeah, yeah. It's not the platform itself, it's, it's what the teacher does with it. I, I think you raise an important point. It's up to the teacher. I think what the teacher tries to get over, understands as well, uh, but also, of course, the topic. Yeah? I mean, Minecraft may be good for, I don't know, three-dimensional thinking and, and other things, collaborating maybe, yeah? But it may be not the best for teaching certain, you know, mathematical skills. Yeah. So. Okay. Wait. If you go to YouTube right now, <laughs> you can find a Minecraft video for just about any mathematical concept. Oh ever. really? So really? Okay. Really, I would have to disagree with you. You could use it for anything, but again, it's just one of the things the teacher yeah. could use. It of course requires also, I think, a lot of work. I, I had in mind with Minecraft this opposite mathematical. I mean, there's a teacher in Los Angeles who uses Monopoly to teach uh, to teach math to to his uh, fifth to eighth graders, and they are competing. There's a, ma a Monopoly champion in in the U.S. Apparently, a competition. So that's any anyone else who wants to to answer this question. I think the last part of the question said, "Does this." 
apply to higher ed. And so, absolutely, there are all kinds of games that are being applied in higher ed and health professions education for students. And they're growing up in the K through 12 with gamification. And so they almost expect it and require it when they get to the higher ed. And Gazillionaire is being used by business schools. And there's a, a statistics uh, Alice course in um, built in California that's being used for statistics and to get um, actually it was used to sort of increase the number of women in engineering, but it's also being used in higher ed. So I think there's lots of examples for that. Yes, yes, you you bring up a good point, and this reminded me of another book, uh, the multiplayer classroom by Lee Sheldon. He's a video game design professor. And he makes basically his class a video game. Uh, so it's, 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 it's in university. The university is teaching that. So it's definitely above uh, 12, K to 12, possible to, to do that. Yeah. I'm just, just throwing all the books at you. I have like 40 or 50 of them. So if you come up with more of these things, I might pick it up multiple times a day. <laughs> um, so let's, let's take a look at another question. Um, uh, and this one is uh, maybe a little bit less related to education. It says, uh, um, can you talk about gamification innovation process and engagement at work? Maybe we look at in, uh, work. Would you would you see that yourself not just you know applied to your audience, like your your students or your um, visitors, museum visitors, but also to your own employees or to yourself? Could you could you see that? To engage yourself more, I have, have you know, lazy colleagues maybe more engaged, or uh, uh, having I don't know the people uh, being friendlier who are helping the visitors. Any anyone? We can modify chore wars to work wars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting idea. I I, I will say that um, you know in, in the last. Uh, several months that I've been exploring Badgie and here at Case, uh, I've been talking to a lot of different people about, um, just on campus, about how it could be utilized and doing a lot of research on, on how it's being utilized elsewhere. And almost always, I'm getting people internal at the university asking me about utilizing badging outside of academic needs. So, so like the HR group or um, some of the professional um, development that's going on, you know, across the campus. Um, they're all trying to find ways to kind of not only motivate, but a way to kind of distribute these, these, these learning achievements internally that's, like I said, not academically focused. And I think there's a huge... Um, possibility for this, not nest, not just inside in higher ed, but in all sorts of um, enterprise applications. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have a lot to say about that because I'm a specialist in exactly that, that thing. So I, whoever has a question on that can also check out the website that's on my biography. Alice Marsha, you wanted to say something? I I, I think it's a it's a very interesting topic about thinking about badges in a non-classroom environment, and, and I, I think that it would really depend on what the motivation is behind the people assigning the badges, right? So, it internally, if suddenly it was that you got a badge if you did X number of blog posts for the museum's website, or you authored this many published, you know, you published this many articles, that might be motivating, but it also could end up having uh, a negative effect on the inside of the institution. You don't know because you wonder, well, what is the motivation for this badge? Is it to be part of a human resources file, for example? So it really is about what's the spirit of the, of the competition. Um, whereas I could see something almost a healthy one where one museum, like museums ac across the world or the country, all are competing to do something against each other. What I think could happen is that internally the staff of institutions bands together, right? And there's a different just a sense of camaraderie. Oh, we'll do that, and we're going to battle against the British Museum or the Smithsonian. That might feel very different than, than battling your colleagues. Depends. Mm -hmm. It really depends on what, what the players perceive as the motivation for the badging. Something slightly different. It's not a, a badging system here, but for some of our professional development in-house sessions, 
for educators who actively teach in the galleries in front of original works of art. Mm -hmm. We meet about four or five times a year and give each other challenges. So that mm -hmm. challenge could be anything from who your audience is or um, what the event might be, what works of art are you choosing, and if it does nothing else, it rejuvenates people's imagination, it sparks sort of a flame under them to think more creatively about how we engage audiences in front of a work of art. So mm -hmm. I think challenging just sort of, can I be a better museum educator than you, is often sometimes enough mm -hmm. um, to enliven an office yeah. environment. Maybe we can ask an expert on that. Uh, we, had, uh, we have a new panelist who has joined us, uh, Elise Daughter. Uh, she's probably the one who gets all the cookies and the gold stars. Uh, maybe she wants to give us an opinion if she likes cookies. Uh, do you like cookies? You okay, that? so it works. You see, yeah. uh, don't, don't worry about badges and cookies. It seems to work. Now, <laughs> hello, hello. So let's uh, come to... The last question, we are, we are running out of time, and you know we've been talking cheerfully about that topic. I'm European, um, and we always are very skeptical about things. We are holding back. We think about immediately the risks and the dangers of that thing. And there's one question that must be from a European here. Paul asks about uh, what, are the, uh, what are the perils of gamification? So what do you see where a problem area could be with that? What Could it go into the wrong direction or so? Maybe a, a word from everyone to ramp up. Who wants to go first? Who wants to stop? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Should I jump in? I, I, I'll just sit my own, this is my own personal opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Met or anything, but I, I think that um, what I really enjoy about the museum environment, not just the museum, but museum environments in general, is that it, there's the option of game gamification or, or gameplay, and then there's also just the option of play. And I think that those of us who work in the museum environment would never want one to strip away the other. Um, the museum is full of examples of, uh, wonderful examples of people who played. Uh, in many ways, and, and these are the and the outcome is what we keep in the gallery some, in, in many cases, and it wasn't a competition necessarily. Sometimes it was, but not necessarily. So I would never want one to remove the possibility of the other. I think you should always be able to, to come in and, and engage with an original work of art or enjoy a gallery uh, experience without having a specific goal in that particular visit, whether it's virtual or in the gallery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ruth, maybe? I, well, you ask a really good question, and I've been trying to think about the answer. You know, as, as Masha and Alice were talking earlier, and they were talking about the cause, um, being a part of gamification and, and having a cause and what brings people to the game sometimes. I think that if one of the perils could be not picking the right cause or not being able to pull everyone to that cause, um, for that game, and then it's, it wouldn't be successful if you think of it as that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Brian, maybe? Yeah, I, um, you know, I think this is, you know, very similar to integrating any other sort of idea or technology into learning is it, and I mentioned this before is it that it really needs to be thought out um, and, and planned um, because if it isn't it's it's doomed for failure just uh, just like you know any other sort of technology um, anything can be successful as long as the time is spent working with it and part of that comes to um, support there needs to be support out there whether it's physical support of instructional designers helping educators helping instructors support from um, leadership that's allowing you to try these new things out uh, I, I think that's the important thing that will um, continue something like game gaming and gamification and being successful and being something that can help us in, in teaching and learning 
but it is important that we we have the support and guidance where necessary because you know you can't just I, I mean most mo mo money teachers out there will tell you you know they they only have so much time in the day where they can you know work on their teaching and learning and in higher ed a lot of times they're focused on their research and they don't have the time or even their personal lives so so we have to think about some of those too and 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 this is something that's just you know and a larger picture anytime you want to integrate something new in teaching and learning. Thank you, Brian. Alice and, and uh, Cookie Expert, last words on that? Uh, I think, just like he said, it's all in the design. It's, that's the only answer you're ever going to get out of me is, is intentional. It's, is we can sometimes focus too much on the game and and miss the forest for the trees. So if you're doing it for the purpose of learning, you need to design it in a way that that does end up being the primary focus and not just in earning points or creating a fun character. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hand back to Alex. All right. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, we could we could talk on this subject for quite a while. So I want to um, want to wrap up today's program by thanking. Um, our moderator, Mario Herger, our panelists, Alice Keeler, Ruth Niemeyer, Alice Schwartz, Masha Tuchinsky, and Brian Yonke, on behalf of the NMC, for taking time to present their take on games and gamification in various educational sectors. Um, participants, if you want more information about anything you saw or heard today, let, let us know by contacting me directly at alex at nmc.org. To learn more about future NMC on the Horizon programs and get involved in our community, please check out our website, nmc.org. Like us on Facebook or friend us at Twitter at nmc.org. Uh, I want to give you a heads up on our next NMC on the horizon. Please save the date for Wednesday, April 9th at noon central for our next NMC on the horizon where we'll talk all things 2014 NMC Summer Conference. Get a, get a preview of who's going to be there and what kind of topics we're going to be uh, cover. So until then, I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us.